Well, good morning. Okay, I'd like to show you a uh, photograph here, a map. If you can see it, that is our universe. You can see it, the Earth is right at the center, all the planets, the sun's halfway out, and then all the stars are outside. The Earth is the center of the universe and everything revolves around it. Well, you can laugh, but for thousands of years, that's what humanity thought. That's what Socrates thought a couple hundred years BC. That's what they still thought in the 1600s, that that's how our universe was. And then in the 1500s, along came a astronomer and mathematician. This guy was from Prussia, which is now Poland. And you may have heard of him. His name is Nicholas Copernicus. And he believed that the sun was the center of our solar system. And if that's the case, the Earth is not the center of the universe. That our planets all revolve around the sun. And he's the one that started to make this model popular that we now believe, like without questioning. And he published his findings, but he did it on his deathbed. And as soon as he published them, the church banned his writings. Right? So he knew what was coming. And they banned it because everybody knows that the Earth is the center of the universe. Right? First Chronicles says, the world is firmly established and it cannot be moved. And Psalm 104 says, he set the Earth on its foundations and it can never be moved. And Ecclesiastes 1 says, the sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. But then along came another scientist. This guy was a physicist, an engineer, an astronomer. Anybody recognize him? Galileo. That's Galileo, and Galileo had made a telescope that was the most powerful one at the time that isn't very powerful now. And in 1610, he published his findings that supported what Copernicus has said, that it looks like the Earth is, the, is not the center of the universe. And he was called up by the Catholic Church and told to cease and desist, and his writings were banned. And over the next couple of decades, there's actually a record. He wrote to a friend of his, Kepler, another physicist, and he complained that many philosophers that opposed him had refused to look through his telescope. He invited them multiple times and they refused. They did not want to look at the evidence. And so in 1632, he published again that the Earth was not the center of the universe. But this time he was a bit shrewder. Instead of publishing in Latin, which most people scientists published in and nobody could read it you know he published in Italian so that anybody that was literate could read it and his book became very popular so within a year the Pope held an inquisition they called him to an inquisition and these this was the findings this I'm going to quote this on June 22 1633 the church handed down the following order we pronounce, judge, and declare that you, the said Galileo, have rendered yourself vehemently suspected by this holy office of heresy. That is, of having believed and held the doctrine, which is false and contrary to the holy divine scriptures, that the sun is the center of the world, and that it does not move from east to west, and that the earth does move and is not the center of the world. And so as a result of this, he was censored, his stuff was banned, he was sent to prison. And it was later commuted to house arrest, and he died there nine years later, in his 70s. Because the church had already decided that Galileo was teaching heresy, that he was dead wrong. And they'd made their opinion based on tradition, thousands of years of tradition, and their interpretation of scripture, which was false, as we know now. And they demonstrated stubborn unbelief. They basically said, don't confuse me with these facts because our minds are made up. And it's interesting because the fellow scientists at the time had been studying this for 200 years. And many of them agreed with Galileo, but you know how many came to his defense at the Inquisition? None. Nobody stood up for him. None because they feared the church and what would happen to them. So today in John 9, where we're going to be, we're going to look at a similar situation where the church leaders had incorrectly made up their minds about Christ. 
They refuse to look at the facts and reconsider their position. In this chapter, Jesus miraculously heals a blind man, a guy who's been blind since birth. And there's no record of this ever happening before this time. He healed blind men, but not ones from birth. And the church refused to look at the facts and they refused to reconsider their opinion. And then they took the blind man and they dragged him through an inquisition, just like Galileo, and nobody came to his help. And the question to think about today is, how are we going to respond to the claims of Christ? Do we ever do what the church did to Galileo? So the context of, of John 9, so I can lay the groundwork. So far in John, we've seen that Jesus has done multiple miracles. Water to wine, healed a sick official son, healed a lame man, fed 5,000, walked on the water. But he also taught the crowds regularly too. He confronted the religious, religious leaders who were mainly the Pharisees, the biggest group. And he was getting in more and more conflict with them. And he made his claim to be God quite clear. And then he just evaded an assassination attempt by the leaders just before this chapter. So today we'll look at him healing the blind man. And I want to focus on the four different reactions that people in this passage displayed to Christ showing he was divinity. So to start off, here's the four ways that people responded. They were skeptical and they questioned the whole thing. Or they just decided, I'm going to evade this issue. I don't want to deal with it. Or they showed persistent, stubborn unbelief. Or they developed some simple faith that then started to grow. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can look at your word today. I thank you for bringing us together. I thank you that you've given us your word. I ask that you would please help me to speak your truth clearly and please send your spirit to guide all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's start. John 9, chapter, verse 1. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. So we start with the disciples asking this question. You know, this guy's blind, so who sinned that he's blind? And that was a common belief at their time. It was wrong back then. It's wrong now. And it was wrong thousands of years earlier. But it was common. If you read the book of Job, that people think was probably the first book written or in, in the course of time, Job was rich and wealthy and he lost almost everything except his life. And his friends kept urging him to repent because he must have lost everything because of his sin, but he hadn't sinned. He didn't have things to repent from. And so it was a common thought. So it makes sense they'd ask it. And Jesus' answer, it's not from sin. It's so God could be glorified. And I think that would really suck to be this guy. If he was actually created blind to live destitute as a beggar for a few decades just so he could be healed and God could be glorified. That's kind of what it sounds like. I don't know if that's really the case. Some theologians say that's not really what the grammar means. It means that this is a bad situation and God will be glorified through it. But I don't know, so I just got to leave that alone. Sorry. But it does raise the timeless question that people have asked forever. Why do bad things happen to good people? They've been asking that for thousands of years. And it's a common complaint that people will bring against God because of that, because they either say God doesn't love them and because he let it happen, or they'll say he's too weak to fix it or stop it, so he's a weakling. And so if he doesn't love us or he's too weak, why should I bother with God? Like, it's pointless. But there's a very simple logical answer to this question, why do bad things happen to good people? And it's that there are no good people. Right? We're all sinners. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So we all deserve death. Nobody deserves anything good. But that answer doesn't really help people you know, when they're suffering. There's a more helpful one. And that's we might not know. We don't always know. 
God's ways are not our ways. He's way above us. But there's lots of possibilities. You may know in a certain situation why something bad's happened to a good person, but we don't always know. I mean, we live in a fallen world, so things happen. Bad stuff happens. Think of the Jasper fire. It started by lightning. It didn't come because of sin, right? Yes, that people have lost their houses. Or it could be personal sin and our own consequences. You know, if I got involved in drugs and alcohol, drunk driving, crack up my car, injure myself, that's my own sin. That's my own fault. I brought it on myself. Or what about someone else's sin? There's a fire going on now, if you watch the news in California, called the Park Fire. Fourth biggest fire in California's history. A guy's in jail for arson because he lit a car on fire and pushed it down into a ravine and started the whole thing. So someone else's sin might bring bad stuff. Or it could be for God's glory, you know, as is mentioned here. It could be to mature our character. That's what it says in James. It could be to bring us to repentance. You know, if we don't listen to God when he's small, still voice, we might need to be hit on the head for it. I have a friend whose son was about 20 years old, died of leukemia. And he didn't live very long once he got diagnosed, but he'd been living a wayward life. And when he was in the Foothills Hospital before he died, he was witness to all his buddies, you know, all his drinking and partying buddies. And he said, if God did not give me this leukemia, he never would have got my attention. I never would have come back to him. He says, the best thing that ever happened to me. So it could be to bring us to repentance. Or there's other reasons. We just can't always say why bad things happen to good people. But there's one thing we can be sure of. That God cares for us when we are suffering. Does care. Hebrews 13, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So the real question shouldn't be why do bad things happen to good people? Or why am I going through this? Or why am I suffering? The real question should be what do I do about it? How am I going to respond? Is my faith big enough for me to trust God through what's happening here? Those should be the real questions. So back to our chapter, the disciples are asking these theological questions, discussing whose sin is it. And what does Christ say? It's not sin. My time is limited on earth. Let's get down to helping this guy. Let's do something good. You know, God created us for good works. Let's just get down and do something about it. So let's go on. Verse 6. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. So this is our miracle. You know, two verses. He makes mud. Sounds kind of gross how he did it, you know. Spit. But spit was thought for thousands of years to have healing, a healing property, especially it came from an important person. So it wouldn't have been so strange. And he spit on the ground the dirt. And if you think back to Jerusalem in those days, there were a lot of animals. I mean, they'd have thousands and thousands coming for the temple sacrifice. So it's not just dirt that's on the ground, right? And so he takes this, he spits on the ground, he makes his mud, and he rubs it on this guy's eyes. And remember, this guy's blind. He hadn't even seen Christ. He didn't see what he was doing. And suddenly he's got this mud stuck on his eyes. And I don't know if he stuck it on his eyelids, because a lot of blind guys have their eyes open, right? Or if he stuck it right in his eyes. I don't know what he did. But anyway, then he tells him, go wash in the pool. And he did not promise he'd be able to see. He didn't promise him a thing. He just said, just go wash this mud off. So the blind man, he knew something weird had happened to him. So he goes and does it. He does it. He does the impossible. And he, uh, Christ did the impossible. The man didn't, sorry. But this man showed faith. I mean, maybe he just wanted to get this mud and manure off his face, right? But he showed faith. He went to the pool that Christ said. And that pool is half a kilometer from where the temple is, which is probably where Christ did this. And this guy's blind, so he's got to, like, make his way through Jerusalem for half a K to get to that pool. So he, he obeyed Christ. It wasn't a simple thing. So let's look at the different reactions now that people showed to Christ. Christ showed he was God with this. We're going to look at them, and it's the same reactions that people have today. When Christ claims he's God, our Savior, our Lord, and consider where we fall among all these possibilities. 
So first we'll look at the neighbors. Verse 8. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed he was, and others said, No, 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 it's not him. He just looks like him. But he himself insisted, insisted I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. And he replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud, and he put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Well, where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. So here's the neighbors. This guy comes home seeing. They've known him his whole life as a blind beggar. And do they celebrate? Nope. They just get skeptical and start asking questions. They're looking for another explanation. He's not the same guy. He's someone else that just looks like him, right? Because this kind of thing doesn't happen. But this healed man, he simply told the facts. He said he made mud, put it on my eyes, I wash, now I can see. So watch today what this blind man does and how he behaves and how he answers questions because his is the correct response to Christ. But the neighbors, they were skeptical. They didn't know what was going on. So what do they do? Instead of celebrating him, they haul him off to the Pharisees. They haul him off to the smart people to find out what went on. So verse 13, so they brought him to the Pharisees, the man who had been born blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied. I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. So the Pharisees, they were part of the religious leaders in Christ's time. They were the largest group, and they were the most legalistic by far. They added tradition, like tons of tradition, to what Scripture said. And they held it as equally authoritative as the Scripture. You know, we know what the Scripture says about the Sabbath in Exodus 20. It's part of the Ten Commandments. God said, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord. On it you shall not do any work. That's basically what it says. But the Pharisees, they had these oral traditions. They would pass on from rabbi to rabbi and they'd keep adding to it. And they actually wrote it all down in a book called the Mishnah. And in this Mishnah, there are 24 chapters on the Sabbath. 24 saying what you can and can't do on a Sabbath, right? And one of them was you can't knead, so you can't make bread, right? You're kneading bread. And mixing water and dirt is kneading it into clay. So you can't do that on the Sabbath according to the rules. So now the Pharisees got a big dilemma here, right? They got to make a decision. Does this miracle that Christ did show that he is from God? Or does the fact that he did this on the Sabbath and it breaks our rules, does that show he's an ungodly sinner? And their tradition and their man-made rules trumped the miracle, right? They decided that he's a sinner. And remember, it might sound silly, but they just, been, they just tried to kill him, right? They're not interested in finding out that he's God. They just tried to assassinate him by stoning at the end of chapter 8. So they got to discredit Christ. They got to discredit him, so they used their man-made rules. And this opens up some food for thought here. There's a lot of Christian denominations. And they all have different traditions and practices. And they have different beliefs in the secondary theological issues. Not the main ones, but the secondary ones, right? And we have to think, do we get adamant that ours are the right ones? And that other people are doing it wrong? Do we ever blindly insist that we're right because we've always done it that way? Are we going to be like the church with Galileo? You know, there's different practices. I think of how we hold communion, how often we hold communion. That's different than most places. Right? What day of the week we meet, how formal we get, what we wear, what songs we sing. Or in theology, there's a creation timeline. People get adamant about that. There's end times, what they think is going to happen. There's what weight we put on different paradoxes in scriptures, because there are paradoxes, like the free will sovereignty issue. You know? Well, that might have opened a can of worms, but uh, I'm not criticizing these things. Balmoral's pretty flexible and gracious about all these secondary things, but 
sadly, these issues have split churches because Christians have drawn their line in the sand and said, we're right, you're wrong. And it's sad because what really matters is finding Christ, not all these secondary things. But the Pharisees make a big issue of secondary things that they made up. Okay, back to 16. Some of the Pharisees said, this man's not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. So there were a few, Cerebi few Pharisees, a few dissenters that just didn't buy this Sabbath argument. They thought this is an amazing miracle. And they recognized that if it's a miracle, he's probably a prophet. And they also had in the rules that if someone was a prophet, they can break the Sabbath rules to help people. But the majority had already decided he's not a prophet, he's a sinner, and he can't break the Sabbath rules. So they went on to their second attempt to discredit Christ. They asked the man what he thought about him. You know, he healed you. Who do you think he is? And this man, he just directly answered the best he could. He basically said, well, I guess he's a prophet because he did something that only God could do. So who else could do it? And that was not the answer they're looking for. Verse 18. They still did not believe that he'd been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one who was born blind? How is it that he can now see? We know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he was blind. But how he can see now and who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. And his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So their third attempt, they tried to disprove the miracle that he wasn't blind in the first place. You know, evidence is never good enough. It's never enough for a stubborn unbeliever. How many times have you talked to someone about Christ or God or the Bible and you keep hearing, well, yeah, but, but what about this? But what about that? Yeah, but, and on and on it goes, right? They've just decided they're not going to believe, right? But here his parents vouched, yeah, this is the guy. He was blind. He was our son. They knew that Christ had performed the miracle. Remember, he'd gone home and talked to all the neighbors and said Christ did it. So he'd obviously told his parents too. And yet, what do they do? They lie. They tell the Pharisees, we don't know who did it. Ask him, right? They're evading the whole thing. They're evading the whole concept, the whole, yeah, concept of Jesus being God or healing him. No doubt they knew it was unprecedented. They, knew, they realized that Christ was probably God, but they were afraid. They were afraid of the leaders, so they stayed neutral. They basically threw their son under the bus, right? They said, let him deal with the Pharisees by himself. And what were they afraid of? This put out of the synagogue. I mean, today, if you get kicked out of a church, which almost never happens, you just go down the street to another one. That's typically what people do. But back then, there wasn't another one to go down the street to. You know, and, and there's two ways people were ex excommunicated. One was for a minor thing, you're gone for a month, you know, and then you can come back. But this one refers to the major one, and it was a big deal. They would blow the trumpets to get everybody's attention. And then they would announce what the person did and a big curse on them. And then they were banned from the synagogue, which was the center of Jewish life. They were banned from buying and selling. They were banned from being employed. There would be no funeral allowed when they died. They were treated worse than the lepers. I mean, they were absolute outcasts from society. They were done. It was a big deal. You know, and persecution happens today, too. I mean, they would be persecuted if they stood up for Christ. Happens today. You know, the persecuted church, we read about that, where people are tortured and killed. Or in Canada here, you might lose friends. You might lose relationships. People have lost their jobs. People have lost their careers for taking a biblical stand. It happens in Canada, too. So the parents showed the second reaction to Christ. They just evaded the issue. They were cowards. They just stayed quiet. They didn't want to get involved. And that's easy to do when you're under pressure. It's kind of the same as denying Christ. You know, Peter did it at Christ's trial. He denied him three times, flat out. 
and we do it too. I've been there. I've just avoided the issue. I don't want to get involved in this discussion. I'm too busy. There's other things going on. I'm just going to let it pass when I should get involved. You know, we make excuses. And it's a dangerous thing to do. Christ told us in Matthew 10, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. That is a huge price to pay. So let's get back to the Pharisees and their circus. Verse 24. A second time they summoned up the man who had been born blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth. We know this man is a sinner. And he replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know. I was blind and now I see. So here's their fourth attempt to discount this whole thing. You know, intimidate the witness. They are getting desperate. They basically said to give glory to God, and that means repent. You know, you've sinned in calling him a prophet. We've decided he isn't one. We know he's a sinner. You've sinned by doing this, so you need to repent of it. Our mind's made up. Don't confuse us with the fact. You're the sinner now. <clears throat> Poor, this guy's healed of his blindness, and now he's called the sinner by the Pharisees. So they're showing stubborn unbelief. That's the one that people show. A lot of people in our society do that. But the man, he went right back to telling what he, what he knew. He said how he did it, I don't know. But one thing I know is he did this. He healed my blindness. He did not hesitate because he didn't know everything. He just told what he knew. And then he talks to them further. They asked him, what did he do to you? How do you open your eyes? And he answered, I've told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? That's sarcasm. Right? Then they hurled insults at the man. You are this fellow's disciples, and we are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. So the man answers, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. So here the Pharisees go back to the same old questions because they haven't got the answer they want. And then they lose it on him. They hurl the insults at him. This is the fifth attempt. If you can't win your argument based on the facts, discredit the guy's character. We see it happening in politics all the time. Right? And it happens in the courtroom. If you can discredit a witness character, it doesn't matter what his testimony is, even if it's true, people won't believe it. Right? And you look at this man, I mean, he's not saved. He hasn't even seen Christ yet, right? He was blind when he put the mud on his face. And yet he challenges them with basic theology. He challenges the leaders, right? He'd been begging, probably at the temple, because that's where people came with money. That's where the beggars would get their, get their best uh, reward. So he would have heard the theology. He would have heard people preaching and teaching. And this guy was right. He said, God doesn't listen to sinners. That's in Psalm 66. If I cherish sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. And he said, God listens to godly people. Proverbs 15, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. So he challenged them with their theological errors and with scripture, and he embarrassed them. So what do they do? They excommunicate him. They put him out. So this poor guy, right? He's blind from birth. He's beggar. He's illiterate. He's destitute, probably except for his parents. And now he could see. He's got his eyesight. And he can suddenly see what sunrise is. He can see what faces are, everything. I mean, that's fantastic. And yet he gets questioned by his neighbors. He gets abandoned by his parents. He faces this inquisition like it's his fault he's healed. And then he gets excommunicated. He's an absolute outcast now. Not allowed to be part of society anymore. So he got his sight, but he lost everything else. And kind of tragic. Anyway, the good part comes. Verse 35. 
Jesus heard that, he'd been thrown him, that they'd thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. So the guy who's been abandoned by society and his religious organization in a horrible situation, we see Christ, the compassion of Christ here. See, it says when Christ found him, Christ went looking for this guy. He went looking for him. You know, that's compassionate. He would have known what happened to him. We read earlier, a few chapters back in John 6, whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. All those the Father gives will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I'll never drive away. So Christ is showing his compassion, looking for this man. And he identifies himself as the Son of Man, which is code word for the Messiah, the Savior, I am God. And the man responds with worship. He accepts Christ as God because he worships him. That shows he does. That's the only proper response to God. So this guy had lost his false religious system, but he gained a relationship with Christ, God incarnate. And he didn't know this was going to happen. But God took care of him, showing his compassion. You know, Christ told us to expect persecution for following him. Matthew 5 makes it really, really clear. You're going to expect the persecution. You know, when I heard one persecuted Messianic Jew say once, if you say we're not persecuted, I've never, never been persecuted, he says, I have a word for you. Just wait. Right? It will come. It will come. But we can expect great blessings. Christ has promised that too. So this man lost a ton, but he gained way more than he lost. He gained the relationship with Christ. And then I like the, I like the final few, few verses here. After Christ comforts the man, he lets the Pharisees have it. He just lets them have it here. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you'd not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Christ is basically saying to them, You are so proud, and you are so in denial with your false teaching that you can't see the truth right in front of your face. You know, you can't see your sin. If you can't see your sin, you can't repent. And if you can't repent, you're staying guilty of it. Yeah, so the physically blind guy had gained his physical sight, and he also got spiritual insight, knew that Christ was God. But those who had great physical sight, but they're spiritually blind, they just stayed spiritually blind. They basically brought judgment onto themselves. You know, Christ says in 39, for judgment I have come into this world. You might say, wait a minute. Christ said he came to save the world, not judge it, right? So how does that mesh? You know, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes him in should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. But the next verse is verse 18 that says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. That's where he's telling the Pharisees they are. They're condemned themselves because they don't believe that he's Christ. So Christ's main purpose was coming to save us, like he did with this man. He gave him his sight, but he came back to find him so that he could be saved. And if we refuse to believe... We just bring the judgment right on ourselves. It's the logical conclusion to rejecting Christ. You know, you bring it on yourselves. Sad. So in summary, I want to go back to the four responses that people can have to the claims of Christ. He'd performed an unprecedented miracle, never before happened. And yet the neighbors, they just question the whole thing. They're skeptical. This can't be the right guy. No way. And the parents, they get evasive. I don't want to discuss it. I'm staying out of it. I don't want any flack. I'm going to avoid the whole issue. And the Pharisees, the stubborn unbelief, always looking for another excuse why Christ can't be God. Their minds were made up, and they irrationally clung to their opinions. They refused to look at the evidence. Same thing the church did with Galileo. Refused to look at the evidence. Right? 
And then there's the healed man. That's the guy to believe and imitate, the guy to watch. His simple growing faith. He started with the facts. He didn't know much. He didn't know much at all, right? But he told people what he did know. I just know Christ did this for me. And his faith grew. He came to decide that Christ had to be a prophet. He had to come from God to be able to do this. And then he became emboldened enough to remember what he knew from scripture and he challenged the false teaching of the church leaders to why Christ must be God. And then he personally accepted Christ as God and he worshiped him. And the benefits he gained far outweighed any difficulties that he endured. So the question to consider this week is, how will you respond to those clear claims of Christ? So this brings us to the Lord's Supper. Last week we heard that Christ had claimed to be one with God. We heard that he identified himself as I am. Well, actually the I, I am, which is the name for the Almighty God. And today we saw that Christ miraculously healed the blind man. He'd shown his supernatural power. So last week he claimed it, and this week he gave evidence of why he was God. His actions backed up his claims. Right? And then we also saw Christ seek out to save this man. Called himself the Son of Man, I am your Messiah. You know, Luke 19 tells us, Christ said, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He came to seek the blind man, and he came to seek and save each one of us. And he did that, saved us through his sacrificial death on the cross. So as we remember this today, we'll distribute the bread, that sacrifice, Christ's body that was broken for us on the cross, and then the juice, which represents his blood. I'll pray for both of them together. At the beginning, while we're doing this, please reflect on what Christ has done for you, who he is, what he's done for you. Eat it at your own timing, and then at the end, we'll pass around some baskets, which are just for the empty cups, right? So if you've repented of your sins, accepted Christ as Savior, please join us in this. And if you haven't, then please just let the trays pass by. Could I call up the men, please? Thanks. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we admit that we are lost sinners. Thank you that Christ came to seek us and to save us, willingly and voluntarily. And with this bread and juice, please help us to remember his body and blood shed for us to pay the penalty for our sins that we could never, ever pay ourselves. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you make salvation available to all who choose to recognize Christ as both Savior and Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, God. Thank you, my brother. benediction today comes from 2 Peter 3. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.